sometimes things can shock you um, because they're unexpected. And the title of my talk is Out of the Blue. The reason I'm even standing here today with all of you and singing and about to talk to you about some stuff around gratitude is because I got a call from Dr. James kind of out of the blue. Uh, literally out of the blue. And he was like, can you, are you busy this Sunday? And it was the one Sunday I had off. Uh, so I was like, yeah, let's do it, you know? So I was so excited. So that's something that comes out of the blue, right? I'm sure you guys all had some stuff that came out of the blue this week. Um, I always like to get checks in the mail. <laughs> I mean, who doesn't, right? I'm still getting some checks for some singing I did uh, on a TV show a couple years ago. And I'm just like, Thank you, universe, every time. And it's not a huge check, don't get me wrong. Like, it's, you know, getting smaller all the time. But <laughs> I think it'll probably be like 29 cents, you know, in a few months. But it's still fun, right? To get it from out of the blue, seemingly, although I did do the work, but to get it unexpectedly, right? I, I've started a new job in the last few months. I think I talked about it last time I was here, just briefly. Um, for so many years, my day job as a musician, which many musicians don't have a day job, they're, you know, fabulous. They just do all music all the time. Um, I always had a day job, at least one, because I was providing for kids and doing the whole thing. So I had the day job, but I wanted to get out of the day job. I wanted to get out of the day job, right? I had to wear scrubs, so I called it my little blue suit. So I was trying to get out of the little blue suit for years. Practitioner training, 2013. Little blue suit, get me out of the little blue suit. I just want to know how to get out of the little blue suit. Uh, will I learn that if I become a practitioner? It, it'll, it'll unfold the way it's supposed to unfold. Um, then I became a minister, still in the little blue suit. I thought, well, the universe must need me in my little blue suit for some reason. I've been in it for a really long time now, so I'm pretty good at what I do in the little blue suit, um, even though I don't want to do that. I'm just fighting against it. So anyway, started a new job. COVID shut down the place I was working. Downsized, didn't hire me back, and I was relieved. I'm out of the blue suit! I was like making an announcement, running. I'm out of the blue suit! I'm out of the blue suit! So I was finally out of the blue suit. <laughs> and I'm still out of the blue suit. But the cool thing, okay, when I got out of the blue suit, I thought, well, I'm never going back to that field. It's in, in the medical field. I'm not doing that anymore, not doing that anymore. But I had all this knowledge. And I wasn't using it or sharing it or doing anything with it, right? So I got a phone call out of the blue from someone I knew from the medical field who had started up her own company, training people with no experience to do what I did, to get their own little blue suit. <laughs> <laughs> God help them. But no, they'll love their blue suit. <laughs> if you're watching, love the blue suit. So, you know, out of the blue, I got a phone call from her. I was like, yes, I'll do that. So now I'm writing scripts for training. I'm recording videos in front and behind of the camera. I'm invested in getting people careers that they wouldn't normally have because education is just not available and too expensive. So. Now I'm doing something with the knowledge that I got being in the blue suit, right? How cool is that? I mean, that's fabulous, right? So um, some of us have things out of the blue that aren't so fabulous and happy when they happen. Uh, medical things can come up. I'm sure none of you are dealing with any medical things, right? <laughs> I mean, we have bodies. Hello, stuff happens. It's like cars or a house. You've got to do stuff to it every now and then. So. I had an unexpected routine medical test, um, routine mammogram thing, came back. I had the 3D. Okay, so those of you who, you know, go get your mammograms, and if you can get the 3D, fabulous. I had the 3D, and now it shows something. And I'm like, oh, that's out of the blue, like, but that's not, like, good out of the blue. That's just not good out of the blue. So I had to go back for testing, further testing, another thing, and an ultrasound, and the whole thing. So, and they scheduled me to see the doctor the same minute, the same day. So I'm like, oh, that's bad. That's really, that's really bad. So I was preparing for the worst. So I'm just waiting to see the doctor. 
Do you ever do this? Prepare for the worst? Ha! Huh. <laughs> Someone does. Okay. I'm not the only one. Okay. Because you feel like you'll lessen the blow if you just prepare. Okay, I'm going to get my affairs in order. I'm ready. I'm going to be gone. You know, I'm going to do... I'm getting ready, you know, calling my loved ones. Okay, I'm going to, you know, what will I say on Sunday? You know, I'm thinking to myself, you know, uh, everything goes through your head. And, uh, you know, he comes in and he said, okay, how are you? I said, well, I'm a little nervous, you know, about this thing. And he said, well, you know, it's all good news. There's nothing wrong. It's because we had the 3D one this time. We didn't have the 3D one last time. And it shows different stuff and everything's okay. And 10% of people get this, this result or whatever. So I was, whew, and then I found myself not able to be relieved. Like I was still upset. I was still upset on my way home. I was still upset because you know what it did for me? I wasn't grateful because I was too focused on, okay, I'm really sad now because I'm, I'm going to die someday. We're all, none of us get out of here, you know, with our bodies alive, you know. So I thought, uh... Why am I so sad? Why am I still sad? I had good news. Why was I sad? Because I accepted the worst as my reality. So don't prepare for the worst. <laughs> prepare for the best because, like I said, even if it is something that's challenging, you know, you're not alone. You have help. You have community. Uh, we're here to know the truth for you. You have practitioners ministers. That's what we teach here, that we know the big picture truth beyond the test result or whatever, beyond the job or the little blue suit, right? So do you guys watch the weather forecast ever just to see what's going to be happening? <laughs> yeah, right. So supposedly we're going to have rain. I'll believe it when I see it, right? You know, the weather forecaster in Los Angeles has must, the most boring job. Reverend Stephen Rambo, like, you just sit around. Yeah, sunny and warm today again. Okay, all right, phone it in. <laughs> you know, seriously. So, um, so my husband is always reminding me that the weather forecast is just a forecast. Because I believe in it, like, well, it's going to rain. He said so. He goes, it's just a forecast. So I think, yeah, what does that mean? Oh, yeah. It can change. Stuff can come out of the blue. Maybe it won't rain. Maybe something else will happen. So are we believing in the forecast? So much so that it's sapping out our joy in the now. That's what I did that day. I believed in the worst case scenario as being present now. And then I had to really go into prayer and meditation. And What's going on with me? What's going on? I was sad to be dying. I didn't want to be dying. But we're all aging, and we're all going through our stuff. And, you know, the best cure for that is to just live. So I decided to live. <laughs> I decided to agree with the test result and live. So this relates to making plans based on a forecast or making plans based on circumstances outside of ourselves. We talk a lot about circumstances being circumstances outside of ourselves. We teach here that we have power over how we react to stuff. We have the power to choose how we're going to handle anything. We don't let a circumstance determine our day. Now, maybe we hate the rain. Okay, I hate the rain. Oh, the rain's coming. Oh, and we walk around. Oh, oh it's raining. Oh, it's so bad. It's so terrible. Oh, I hate the rain. It's still just rain. It's just rain. So why not be happy? Sing in the rain. Do, be, do a Gene Kelly on it. You know, sing and dance in the rain. Um, Emerson said, storms make trees grow deeper roots. But I love Emerson because he was such an influence, you know, a transcendentalist, you know, all about nature being God. You know, if you ever read any of Emerson's essays, so amazing. So yes, deeper roots deeper spiritual roots so we can go deeper when the storms are happening we can actually use it to grow deeper roots like emerson said 
Planned storms are kind of fun. You can, you know, get firewood if you have a little fireplace. You can snuggle, get some chocolate, you know, hang out, watch a movie or whatever. It's the unplanned storms, right? So it's the whole unplanned, unexpected, out of the blue thing that freaks us out. Am I right? Planning ahead gives us security. Oh, I have control over that. I'm planning ahead for that. Um, but truly, I mean, how much can we plan ahead for? We do, we plan, even if, even if I knew the world would end tomorrow, I would still plant my cherry tree. Isn't that that famous quote, right? We planned because we do. That's what we do. We don't know what's going to happen, but um, we have a faith that everything that happens to us happens for us. Can you repeat that after me? Everything that happens to me happens for me. Everything that happens to me happens for me. How many of you actually believe that? <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> we get into judgment around what's for me and what's not for me. And we need to leave that at the door. We need to trust that everything that's happening to me, eventually, in the universe's time frame, not mine necessarily, is always spiraling up to a higher level of consciousness, a higher level of good, yes? Yeah, so if we take away that judgment factor, that's bad, ooh, that's good, and we get into gratitude for everything, forgive everything. <laughs> you know, we've got elections coming up, we're gonna have people who we know and love who don't vote the way we want them to. Forgive everything. It doesn't say, don't do anything. <laughs> I noticed that Dr. James didn't say, don't do anything. Just sit there and wait for stuff to happen. He says, forgive everything. And we talk about taking action in 2022, right? We take action, we move our feet, we treat and move our feet, as we say in this philosophy. Meaning, we set our intention, we use the power of positive prayer, but we take action. We don't sit in our house in our little blue suit waiting for the universe to take the little blue suit away. The whole time I was in the little blue suit, I was building my consciousness through classes, through becoming a practitioner, through becoming a minister, through being in community, through writing songs about this philosophy, positive message music. So I was building that along the way so I'd be ready to let go of the blue suit. I wasn't ready. That's why I didn't get rid of the blue suit. I wasn't ready to get rid of the blue suit. I thought I was ready. I wasn't ready. So I want to quote Dr. James from Mental Muscle. Some of y'all are taking the Mental Muscle class this time, and um, Stephanie's going to get a new Mental Muscle book uh, from the bookstore for being here today. Dr. James says, your purpose is your passion. Don't go looking for it. It'll find you. And... I add to that, sometimes it'll find you out of the blue when you least expect it. If you're doing your passion, if you're living your passion, you know, Reverend Michelle is doing her passion, her job that she does, apart from being a minister, she's being a minister in her job. She's bringing that with her. So that is adding to her job. That is her passion. How many of y'all can say you're living your passion or at least doing it part of the time? Okay. So how does that feel? Can you feel grateful for that? Yeah, that ability to do your passion. Do what you love to do, because that's uniquely you. Nobody else is going to be you. The way you do it, the way you are. They can try. It's Emerson also said, you know, uh, imitation, well, he didn't say that, but imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, really. People try to be like you or want to be like you, but really, you're just being yourself. Be yourself. That's who you're here to be. So, just closing with a little story of flying. <laughs> because I talked many years ago about how when I was on a little tour with Jamie Lula and Gary Lynn Floyd and Doug LeBeau, we went to um, Boston. Boston. <laughs> Boston. Bo Boston. We went to Boston. <laughs> Boston! Sorry, Bostoners uh, out there. I'm not making fun of you at all. It's beautiful over there. 
Um, we went there, and then we were going to fly to like Cape Cod, which is a, a little flight over the water, over the water in a very small plane. One of those small planes is so small that they kind of weigh your purse to decide where to put it in the plane. Like to me, I was like, "You're seriously what? Seriously, what are you doing?" And depending on how much the guys weighed, like they put, you know, us. In, it was only like six or seven seats or something. I was freaking out. I was like, "Buddy Holly died in a plane like this. All the famous rock stars died in a plane like this. I don't want to go in this plane." So I had, at that time, many years ago, kind of a fear of flying. If you couldn't tell, I did not enjoy it. Kind of like Dr. James used to be about what was it? Scuba diving, snorkeling. He was always that way about snorkeling. Um, and I'm pointing to his son, Will, over here. Um, yeah, so we, we shared different fears about that. But flying for me, woo. So it was called Cape Air, because it flies you to the Cape, you know, Cape Cod. So I called it Cape Fear. Because for me, <laughs> that's, the name, that's what should have been written on the airplane. Anyway, I got to the other side of the water. Uh, my uh, bandmates just, I was like this the entire time, just squatted down, squeezing the life out of their hands and just singing a chant. All is well, all is well, all is well. I'm grateful, all is well. And I got to the other side and then everything was fine. And then coming back, I was much better. I was only this far down. <laughs> no, I was okay. So four times I go through fear when I'm flying somewhere. I just got back from Ireland, which was glorious. Yeah, just can't even. So good. And rainy. Those of you who don't like the rain, I'm sorry. Sorry for you, but it was a little rainy. It was great. I realized that when I used to fly overseas to Ireland, big flight, long flight, I would get to the airport and then there's that period of waiting where you can't board yet and you're waiting to board. I would sit there and call all of my children, call everyone I knew, I love you. I really love you. And if I don't come back, you can have my ring. Okay. All right. I'll see you. Okay. Bye. I love you. That was me. <laughs> it was like right on time. I'd get to the airport, upset stomach, start crying hysterically, call my kids, call my friends and family. So um, that was the first time it's fear-based for me was, was waiting to get on the plane. The second point of fear was takeoff. Anybody love the takeoff? Some people love the takeoff. It's like a rush. And I'm like, you must be crazy. <laughs> I don't love the takeoff. I'm okay with it now. I squeeze the heck out of my husband's hand now if he's with me, but it which he usually is, thank God. But the takeoff was point number two where I was like, yeah, no, I don't want to do this. I, uh, I, I don't want to do this. I got to get out of here. I don't want to do this. So I would start then, years later, I would start chanting, like, seek yoga chants, you know, Om Namo Gurudev, Namo Gurudev, Namo Gurudeva. Or I would say the rosary, the Catholic rosary. I'm not even Catholic. I would say the rosary <laughs> just in case, you know, Mary can help me out here. And I'm, Catholics, I'm apologizing to you now. No, I'm not making my, I actually do have rosary beads and I know how to do it and I, I, it does give me peace and centering. So, that takeoff, that's, that's when I would always chant. Then the next thing is flying in turbulence. So now I'm in the air, finally got in the air, now the plane is going, woo, you know, and I'm, my water bottle's flying, and I'm like, we're gonna die! <laughs> so that would be the next point of fear for me was the turbulence, right? And then there's the landing. The landing is usually the best part, but sometimes it can be pretty bad. Now the landing to LA this last time was, wow, it was, Boom! <laughs> the brakes were like, <laughs> so it wasn't the smoothest landing I've ever had. But that being said, I have done a lot of work on myself with these fears around flying. And I relate them to life, waiting, waiting to board the plane, waiting to get a test result, waiting to meet the right person as a partner, waiting to get that job, waiting, et cetera, et cetera. You get where I'm going with this, right? The waiting. We're in a lot of fear around that sometimes. Taking off. Now I got the job. I got the partner. I've got the, now I have to actually go through it and do it and raise myself up. Like Reverend Michelle was saying, push out those boundaries of our comfort zone and embrace something new. Ooh, that's scary, embracing something new. That's the takeoff, okay? Being in the air in the turbulence. How many
many people's lives are never turbulent? Raise your hand. I just want to kiss your robe because, <laughs> or something. <laughs> Rub your feet or something. Because, it's, you know, I never have heard of that, right? There's turbulence in all of our lives. And if not in our lives, if you're one of those people who's just zen and blissed out all the time, bless you. And like the song I sang, look beyond our own selves. There's plenty of people having issues that we can help, right? So if it's not you that I'm talking about, think beyond you. And, and that's that part. So the turbulence and then the landing. The landing is being grounded in our faith that everything's going to be okay, that we're landing safe, we're held, we're supported, right? By Mother Earth, by Father Sky, we are supported, and we're landing safe and sound. So on this last flight, I was getting ready for the takeoff. I got through the waiting without crying or calling anyone. <sighs> yes. And I got on the plane waiting now for the takeoff and getting settled in my seat, etc. And then I started doing my chanting. But it wasn't connecting for me. I was doing all of my Sikh prayers. I was doing my, you know, Buddhist prayers. I was doing the rosary. I was doing everything. But it felt kind of outside me. And I, I learned to pay attention to those moments when we have that little hit, that little feeling like, hey, what's going on here? And I said, you know, I need a, a chant that's just for this, that's exactly for this, not some, a chant that was written for something else, right? I don't need a prayer of protection from 2,000 years ago right now. I need a chant for flying right now and releasing and accepting and getting into it. So I unbuckled myself, even though the takeoff was kind of imminent. We were just starting to like move down the thing, the big freeway thing of planes, the, what do you call it? The runway. <laughs> I don't even want to know what anything's called because it's just, you know, I was, you know, we're getting ready, we're rolling and we're moving and I'm like, I have to write this down because out of the blue came a chant. Out of the blue, just whoosh, this is your chant. So I got my iPhone out and I just was just whispering to it so nobody would be bothered. And then I sat down again and buckled up and I did that chant. So if y'all are okay with it, I'd like to share that with you and then have you kind of chant with me as well. And that's how we'll close my talk today. So um, yeah, so I would say if you're good with the whole flying thing and this doesn't apply to you at all with flight, grand, that's terrific. But there are plenty of other areas, as I illustrated just a minute ago, where perhaps you might need to do some releasing of some fear or needing to control something. Like if I'm not flying the plane, which I don't know how to do, but when I'm not flying it, I have to let go of that control. I have to trust whoever's flying that plane, right? Mm, that's a tough one. That can be a tough one for me because I like to control things so that I feel safe. I don't know if anyone can relate to Can you relate to that at all? Yeah, a little bit, yeah. I know Dr. James relates to it, because I know he's a recovering control freak like me, but <laughs> which is why I love him so much. Um, so anyway, the four stages of fear and the four stages of this chant. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about love is calming me, Love is lifting me, like lift off. Love is flying me in the turbulence. And love is grounding me. Okay? So this is what came through on Aer Lingus in the middle of <laughs> tarmac, or whatever you call it. <laughs> love is calming me. Sing with me. Love is lifting me. Love 
flying me. Love is flying me. Love is flying me. Love is flying me. Right now. Love is flying me. Love is a flying me. Love is flying me. Right now. Love is grounding me. Here we go. Love is grounding me. Yes. Love is grounding me. Love is grounding me. Right now. Love is grounding me. Love is grounding me. Love is grounding me. Right now. Love is loving me. Love is loving me right now. Love is loving me. Love is loving me right now. Right now. Take a deep breath. Mm. And so it is. Namaste. <laughs>